So it's time to examine the basic notions of validity and soundness as they come up in the context of the predicate calculus. So remembering how that would work for the propositional calculus, for propositional formulas, something was valid in the propositional logic meant it was true in all truth environments. It was true for all possible truth assignments to the propositional variable. So here's a familiar example. P implies Q or Q implies P because this a uh, formula comes out to be true no matter which of the four possible truth values, pairs of truth values, P and Q might have. So it's a typical example of a propositional validity which we could easily verify by truth table. Now, the idea for predicate calculus is that validity means that the formula is true in, w w no matter what you choose to interpret the formula to mean, no matter what meanings you actually give to to what the formula is talking about. Well, what are the three things that you have to decide in order to make sense out of what a predicate formula is saying? You need to know what the domain is. We've seen in class exercises how crucial it is to figure out whether a formula is true or not to know what the domain is. And second, I need to know what is the meaning of the predicates or that you assign to the predicates over that domain. So here's an example. Um, it says that if for all z, p of z and q of z holds, then for all x, p of x holds, and for all y, q of y holds. Now, in order to figure out whether or not this is true, I need to know, first of all, what's the domain that the variables x, y, z are ranging over? It might be the real numbers, might be binary strings, might be all sets or some weird thing like that. Um, and then I also need to know what is it that P is saying about an element. For what elements is P true? And also for what elements is Q true? I need to know the interpretation of P and Q over the domain. What do they mean? What predicates do they stand for? Well, the, um, the weird thing and the crucial thing about predicate calculus validity is that we're looking at formulas that are true no matter what the domain is and no matter what predicates P and Q are assigned to mean. This is a formula that's logically true no matter what you're talking about. Another synonym for this is it's known as a tautology. It's a logical truth that has nothing to do with any particular thing that you're concerned about. Um, let's look at another example. Uh, this is De Morgan's Law for Quantifiers. It says that uh, not for all x, p of x, uh, if and only if there is a y, not p of y. That if and only if should have been our connective. This equivalence formula is uh, a valid formula. Well, why is it valid? Let's see if we can just understand it intuitively before we start struggling further with it. What the left-hand side is saying is, look, not everything has property p. Not all x have, uh, have the property that p of x holds. Not everything has property P. And the claim is, look, if not everything has property P, there's got to be something that has property not P or that doesn't have property P. So if not everything has property P, there is something that doesn't have property P. Conversely, if something doesn't have property P, then clearly not everything has property P. So that's the hand-waving intuitive argument for why this if and only if or equivalence holds. And it holds really no matter what the domain is, no matter what Pre uh, predicate P happens to mean about that domain, this the equivalence is guaranteed to hold. It's another example of a tautology. Instantly, why is it called De Morgan's Law? Well, if you think of for all x as uh, an infinite disjunction, it's saying the and over all possible x's in the universe, then it's saying that not these ands, if you distribute the not over the ands, they become exists a y, which is the same as saying or of all possible y's in the domain uh, not P of Y. So it's the same rule that we saw for propositional connectives where the or is acting like an infinite uh, and and the E is acting like a potentially infinite or. All right, let's go back to looking a little bit more carefully about how would you really convince yourselves if you're trying to be careful that one of these formulas it really is valid as claimed. Um, and let's look at this example, the, the first one, that for all z, p of z and q of z implies for all x, p of x and for all y, p of y. How would you prove a thing like that? Well. Um, the basic stru proof strategy is, I'm gonna, when I'm trying to prove that some implication holds, is assume the antecedent, the left hand side, or the hypothesis of the implies, and prove the conclusion or consequent of the implies. So let's assume that the left hand side is true, and the right hand side is true, and prove that the right hand side is true. If we can do that, no matter what the domain and meanings of P and Q are, then 
we've shown that it's valid. It's a, it's a logical tautology. So I'm right rewriting the formula here using the more concise notation of an upside down, uh, upside down V for and and an arrow for implies, just so I can fit it in one line across the top of the screen and remember what we're talking about. And let's start talking through how, you might, how might you prove this thing? Well, again, I'm saying the strategy is to assume that the left-hand side holds. So what that means is that we're assuming that for every possible value of z in the domain, q of z and p of z is true. That's what this says. That's what the interpretation of for all z, q of z, and p of z means when you give me the domain uh, and you tell me what q and p mean, then I know that that's saying that if I pick any element z in the domain and I evaluate q of z and p of z, it's going to come out true. OK. <coughs> now, uh, let's suppose that uh, in our uh, choice of looking at all the elements in the domain, that we choose a particular value z uh, of c for the variable z. Suppose that uh, that what I'm saying here that for all values of z, what I mean is pick a value for z like c and see what happens. So we're saying that look, if the value of of z is c, then what we can conclude is that both q of z q of c holds and p of c holds. Well. Um, Q of C no longer has any quantification in it. There's no variables in it anymore because C is a particular element. So to say that Q of C holds and P of C holds is uh, certainly implies that Q of C holds all by itself. Okay, That's easy. Uh, and that's a basic propositional bit of reasoning. P and Q implies P or Q. Now, the, now here's the, the way that we kind of move the quantifiers around. We argue that, look, what did I do? What's C? C was just the, uh, the name of an arbitrary element of the domain about which I assumed no properties other than uh, it satisfied the, uh, the hypothesis, the left-hand side, that C had the property Q of C and P of C. And since C could have been any element of the domain at all that satisfied this property, what I can conclude is that uh, since I've just shown that Q of C holds, I really can conclude that for all X, Q of X holds, because C could have been any X. And that bit of reasoning, which may or may not be comfortable for you, is formalized and is known as the rule of universal generalization, UG. We'll talk about it more in a minute. Uh, and then by a symmetric argument that I proved for all x, q of x, I can also prove for all y, p of y. And once I have these two things are both true, I can conclude that their and is true. And I have proved the right-hand side and the proof is finished. Now, I feel a little guilty calling this a proof because I haven't exactly told you what the rules of the game are here. There's something that's sort of a little circular about it because uh, I'm just proving this uh, logical formula by uh, using intuitive math properties about what for all means. I'm saying, okay, for all z means for all x, for all values z in the domain, and you're supposed to know what that means. And likewise, uh, that you're supposed to know what it means to say that for all the elements in the domain, q of, q of x holds. Uh, so I haven't proved this other than to sort of rephrase it in English and use uh, intuitive uh, properties of math, which are fine and correct, but I haven't really said what the rules of the game are. So it's a little bit kind of circular and cheating to call this a proof. It's an argument that's that's pretty helpful in figuring out whether something is valid, but until we know exactly what the rules of the game are, what it's fair to assume and what it's fair not to assume, um, then we can't really call this a proof. Now, there is a way to formalize all of this. And if you do, this argument that I've gone, th gone through is, in fact, very close to what uh, the rules of formal proof would require. But we're not going to actually try to do that. But I will talk about um, the rule of uni universal generalization in a minute. But before we do that, let's look at an example, which you also need to be able to cope with where uh, a formula is not valid. So this is a formula that's very simple, similar to the first one, except I've changed the ands to ors. So there used to be an and here, and there used to be an and there. And in that case, was the, that was the thing that we proved was valid. Now I'm going to replace it by an or, and I claim this one's not valid. Now let's read it intuitively so that we can see why it's obviously not valid. What this is saying is, look, if everything has property p or property q, everything has one property or the other, that that implies that everything has property P or everything has property Q. Well, that's, that's 
uh, silly. I mean, suppose everything is either black or white. That doesn't mean that everything is black, and it doesn't mean that everything is white. Some things are black, some things are white. So this is simply not going to be a valid uh, assertion. It's not a tautology. But let's be a little bit more precise about how do you know it's not valid. Well, it's not valid means that there's an interpretation that I can explain to you where this fails. So that's called a counter model, where I give you a domain, and I tell you what P means, and I tell you what Q means, and I then check that the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. Well, uh, let's look at it. So uh, I need the left-hand side to be true, the right-hand side to be false. And in order to get that, I'm going to choose the simplest domain which will work here, which is a domain of two elements. Call them 1 and 2. And I'm going to let uh, q of z mean that z is 1, and p of z mean that z is 2. And now we can check. The left-hand side is saying, look, for all of the z's that are either 1 or 2, all of the z's in the domain, um, either z is 1 or z is 2. Well, sure, that's definitely true. The conclusion is that everything in the domain is 1. Well, that's not true. And Or everything in the domain is 2. Well, that's not true. And I have figured out the, the uh, hypothesis is true. The conclusion is false. That's a counter model. So now we're ready to take a further look at this uh, unusual rule of predicate calculus, universal generalization, which gets formulated this way as an inference rule. Um, if you have deduced f of c, where f is an arbitrary formula and c is a constant, then in fact from that you can conclude for all x, f of x. Now this rule has a restriction on it, which is that c has to be a constant symbol that has not appeared earlier. Now what that means is, remember, when we're doing a deduction from axioms and rules of inference, we start off with a bunch of axioms, and then we apply an inference rule, we get another formula. We apply an inference rule, and we get another formula. Uh, and we continue doing that. Uh, if I, somehow or other, I wind up proving f of c, and c has not appeared before in the derivation, other than this very line where f of c is appearing, uh, then uh, I can conclude for all x f of x. But I don't want to get c to be constrained by too many prior hypotheses, or uh, I'll be in trouble. OK, so uh, uh, we would say just in short that c is a fresh symbol, meaning it hasn't occurred earlier in the derivation. And that's the rule of universal generalization. Now, there's a subtlety about this rule that's even bothersome, which is that this rule is not sound in the same simple sense that propositional inference rules were sound. Propositional inference rules had the property that uh, if from a bunch of formulas you could derive another formula, then it meant that in any interpretation in which the bunch of formulas that were the antecedents were true, then the consequent were true. And that's not the case here. In particular, there are interpretations that I could find, typically, where I choose a meaning for C, an element of the domain that I'm going to assign to be the meaning of C, and uh, that has whatever property F is asserting, but not everything has property F. So I can find uh, uh, interpretations where F of C is true, because I picked the C carefully uh, that to have property F, but not everything had property F. So for all X, P of X, F of X wasn't true. So implication does not hold. But still, this is a sound rule. And the soundness uh, is a slightly weaker notion, namely that uh, in contrast to the propositional case, uh, the notion of soundness that we're going to use is that if f of c is valid, then it's safe to conclude for all x, f of x is valid too. And this is uh, consistent with standard mathematical usage. Let's think about quickly about this example with the Pythagorean theorem, which we had in the very first class. So what I'm saying is let a, b, and c be the sides of a right triangle where c is a hypothesis, hypo hypotenuse, <laughs> then a squared plus b squared equals c squared, period. Now, when I write that down, I'm following the usual mathematical convention that when I tell you a squared plus b squared plus c squared holds, I mean that it holds for all c, and as a matter of fact, for all a and b as well. So from the fact that I'm writing down a squared plus b squared equals c squared, I could have concluded for all x, y, z, uh, x squared plus y squared uh, equals z squared, where x, y, and z uh, satisfy the conditions that they're the sides of a right triangle. So in a certain sense, this rule um, f of c is exactly standard mathematical uh, uh, convention. 
that uh, f of c holds. The, the stuff about the, the right triangle would be part of f. So built into f would be, if c has certain properties, then c has other properties. Assuming that f of c, I can conclude for all x, f of x. And that's the justification for the rule.